Broadcast permission for the following program is made possible by the Columbia Broadcasting System. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. A triptych is defined in Webster's unabridged dictionary as a picture or carving in three parts, side by side, especially an altarpiece consisting of a central panel and two flanking panels that fold over it. Thus, by definition, it represents a sacred figure and usually three aspects of that figure. This story concerns a triptych that represents a holy profane and baleful figure in all its different aspects. You still think I'm a candidate for the nut house, Joan? Oh, Walt, don't talk like that. By this weekend, we should know who that woman is. If she is just your sweet old great aunt, I'll crawl on my belly and apologize. But if she's what I think she is, and she means any harm to you or Kip, so help me, I'll murder her first. <laughs> Our mystery drama, Triptych for a Witch, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Margaret Hamilton. I'll be back shortly with Act One. In many cultures, the aged had a function and were treated with reverence and respect. Less and less this is true of the Occidental cultures. I enter no discussion of whether this is right or wrong. Frequently, the elderly would prefer to be left alone to pursue their own destinies. And yet, when the moment comes, and some very ancient relative is left alone, particularly a woman, some atavistic instinct, or is it just plain guilt, drives many of us to open at least our homes, if not wholly our hearts, to them. This is the story of two such people. But may heaven protect you from the strange and awful experience they unwittingly laid themselves open to. Flight 101. Well, Joan, as the governor of North Carolina said to that other guy, this is just about it. Did I know my great-grandfather was going to get married again just before he died? And here I thought I was marrying an orphan. Now I find out you tricked me. Oh, I just forgot about Charlie. He's 60 years older than me. I didn't even know he was still alive. Oh, but she wrote such a sweet letter. There isn't anyone else who's family. So the least I can do is help out poor old Charlie's widow till she finds out what she's going to do. Okay, no sweat. How old is uh, old Charlie's widow anyway? Search me. Just before our wedding, when Mother died, she mentioned out of the blue that my great-grandfather had suddenly married at the age of 82. <laughs> then you came into my life, and every other thought I ever had went out the window. Well, that's why I'm so jealous of anyone horning in. Old Charlie had a real eye for the ladies. The first three times he married, only one of them wasn't young enough to be his daughter. This one might turn out to be young enough to be his granddaughter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we're about to find out. Like you said, this is it, for better or for worse. The times you look back and would like to have bitten your tongue for some crazy thing you blurt out. Not that I knew right away. Matter of fact, when we first spotted her, the old gal didn't look so bad. Oh, she was no spring chicken. She was old, all right. With a little round face like a withered apple that still had red cheeks and sharp blue eyes that glittered like agates and didn't miss a trick darting out from the shadows of a wide-brimmed hat with a conical crown that looked a little like it might have been left over from Halloween. But for all her age, she was spry, skipping along like a sandpiper with a pet carrier in one hand and a carpet bag in the other. Joan? I'm her. 
Your great-grandfather's Hester. And this must be Walter. Oh, hello, dear. How did you know us? Know you anywhere. Spitting image of Charlie, only prettier. Ah, uh, here, let me take those heavy things from you. Oh, then, thanks, no problem. You can have the bag. I'll hang on to Smokey. He likes to stay real close. Smokey? My cat. Oh, shh. You're almost home again. Just want to get Captain Jack out of my pocket before he stirs up a real... <gasps> Some of the words. <laughs> Captain Damnation. It talks. Of course it talks. He's a parrot. Well, a kind of parrot. Half moon, they're called. You don't mind about Smokey and Captain Jack. There won't be any trouble. Oh, of course we don't mind. We're just a little surprised, that's all. <laughs> Doesn't that bird need a cage? Can't abide them. He sits on my shoulder. Or a perch I have for him in the carpet bag. <gasps> well, he won't fly away. Can't. Flight feathers are clipped. Not that he would anyways. You mean you brought that bird all the way from Minnesota in your coat pocket? Of course. He sleeps there. Oh, I take him out when we change planes. He was complaining. He doesn't really like to fly. Oh, that's a switch. Well, uh, shall we get this show on the road? It was all kind of comical to begin with. I mean, here I was, 23, a rookie cop, just off probation after a hitch in the Navy, and already I was married, had a kid, and now I just inherited an aged great-grandmother. Plus a cat and a talking parrot. Who needs it? I started off easy, play it cool, just like Joan and me agreed. No ties, except for getting married. But outside of that, just hang loose, enjoy being young, keep all the options open. And before you know it, we're trapped. Or are we? Will you climb off the ceiling, honey? What do you want of me? It's crazy. The whole thing is crazy. Oh, wow. Aunt Hester, a cat that bites. And I'm not giving you any line, but I think that half-baked parrot is on something. <laughs> you know, that's funny. You know, you, you really object to her being here, don't you? Oh, what about our vacation on the Cape? Oh, are we going to have to lug her there? Not on a bet. It's just us alone. Thanks to your sister Rosie, who's going to take our child and heir off our hands for two weeks. You see? Relatives can be of some use. In time of dire distress. Well, if anything happened to Rosie, Aunt Hester could probably... Uh -huh. Well, we decided that was the best name for her. Everything else was sort of clumsy. Anyway, as I was saying, Aunt Hester could always fill in as babysitter. Now, I wouldn't leave Kip alone here in the apartment with an old witch like that. Don't call her a witch. She's a sweet old lady. Oh. You have something special against Aunt Hester? Oh, no, baby. Oh, what could I have against? Well, like you said, a nice, sweet old lady. But for once, and I guess the first time, I wasn't telling the wife I loved the truth. On the surface, everything was nice about Aunt Hester, even that spiteful cat and the cockamamie bird. But the vibes were wrong somewhere. Maybe it's the reason I became a cop. I got this special thing about people. All I gotta do is meet someone. And within a minute, some buzzer goes off. Wrong guy, right guy. It's never failed me yet. Of course, Rosie, I understand. Uh, no, we couldn't take a chance at Kip's age. Oh, please don't worry, we'll work it out. Is there something wrong, Joan, dear? Oh, well, nothing earth-shaking, I guess. It's just that our vacation's messed up. Oh, what's the matter? Oh, Rosie's oldest child has just come down with measles. That changes all our plans, doesn't it? Oh, not yours. We'll see you off back to Duluth the end of the week. I'd be happy to put things off and stay here until you've had your vacation. Oh, I couldn't do that. Kip would be too much for you. Unless... Unless what? Oh, uh, unless you wanted to come along with us to the Cape. It's lovely there, and then Walt and I could have our cake and eat it, too. <laughs> if you're sure Walt wouldn't mind, I'd be happy to. How could I object or complain? It seemed the perfect solution. Then why was I ridden with doubts and fears that I concealed from Joan? They only began to take shape when we finally did go to the Cape. The cabin was right on the beach, up on a sand dune facing the Atlantic. Joan and I had lots of time to swim and surf, while Aunt Hester kept an eye on Kip. 
But every so often, Joan would have mother's guilt feelings and decide that this particular morning would be just for Kip and her. And on one of these mornings, I had gone beachcombing and on the way back had stopped for a rest, half covered by sea grapes, and had fallen asleep. Of a sudden, some imminent time clock woke me, and I was looking towards the beach where I saw Smokey the Cat prowling and pawing in the receding tide as if he were harvesting. I got to my feet. My eyes, even after sleep, were still partially sun-blinded and headed down to the water. As I came near him, that cat looked around and seeing me suddenly billowed out to Aunt Hester's plumpness. Barefoot and bare-legged, her skirts kiked up to her knees. Aunt Hester! Why, hello, Walt. What on earth are you doing here? Me? Oh, just gathering some seaweed. Why? Huh. Funniest thing. From a distance, I... Well, it seems silly to say it, but you, you look like Smokey. My cat? <laughs> For land's sake. How would a cat go near seawater? You look pretty sunburned. Maybe you got a little too much sun. Do you feel all right? Mm, yes, I, I guess so. What do you want the seaweed for? <laughs> One of my little secrets. Maybe we better get on back up to the house and let you and your pretty Joan go picnicking while you got the chance. The chance? Oh, you know what I mean. Summer's growing short. Not much time left. <laughs> An innocent enough remark, surely. It was growing short, and soon we'd have to get back to the city. But why did it have some sort of eerie significance to me? Why did I feel a long run of cold fingers down my back, the uneasy queasy feeling a cop gets every time he has to draw a gun to protect himself? Sorry the weather turns sour on us, Joan. We'll be back to shore before the squall. Oh, I don't care about the weather. We've gotten duck before and thought it lots of fun. Don't you want to get home? Me? Sure. How about you? Oh, yeah. Well, where else? Well, I don't know. You don't seem to like your home much since my Aunt Hester came around. Okay. You want to lay the cards on the table? I don't. And why not? I don't know how to tell you. I used to read books about the hackles rising on someone's neck. I never knew exactly what it meant. I do now. Well, how could you? You have to have feathers like a bird or hair like an animal. I feel as if I do. Like Smokey or Captain Jack. The unholy three. And now when she puts that hat on, she looks just like a witch. Oh, Walt, how can you say something like that about somebody as sweet and helpful as Aunt Hester? I don't know. It, it just doesn't make any sense. Except like this afternoon, the cat. I, I mean, uh, she. I, I mean, well... What would Aunt Hester be doing gathering seaweed? <laughs> that. Well, maybe you haven't noticed, but the impossible has happened. In spite of vitamins, health pills, everything we take, I've been catching a cold. Aunt Hester says she has an old-fashioned remedy for it. Hemeopathic. A tea made from seaweed. Joan. What? I want you to promise me something. What? Don't take any of that tea. Oh, but darling. I, I want to promise. On your love for me, don't touch that tea. All right, all right. Don't blow your cool. I'm with you. You're the man that calls the turn. If Joan was puzzled at me, so was I at myself. What was it? This subconscious fear that slowly was invading me. What was I afraid of? A little old lady and a cat and a bird she tended as carefully as our child. But some wild alarm bell was ringing deep in the pit of my stomach, and my police training reacted instinctively. That night, through the precinct station, I put some queries on the wires, and I picked up a sample of the seaweed and airmailed it to the police lab. Duluth police confirmed Charles Harrod Higby died when his house burned down on date named. Also killed in fire was his wife of less than 12 months, Hester Combs Higby, Nay Channing. Both buried Sunnyside Garden Cemetery. No known relatives. Funeral expenses covered by estate. No residue. My ESP working again. This time when I least wanted it. If Jones and Hester was dead, who was this stranger in our home? What did she want? And then, 
the clincher. Hello? Walt, it's Jake. Hi, Jake. What you got? On this junk you mailed me for analysis. Yeah, the seaweed. Well, that's what it is, all right. Seaweed. Nothing but a simple fungus. Why, is it poisonous? Absolutely not. Wouldn't harm a fly. And unless, of course... Uh, unless what, of course? It's kind of nutty, you know, but it's a special fungus in a way. Oh, now, come on, Jake. Let me have it. <laughs> I feel kind of silly, Walt. I mean, it's only because ever since Maud died, I'm kind of a, well... Like Dickens, an old antiquarian, and I, I read up on offbeat subjects. Like what? Well, this particular seaweed. In the Middle Ages and all like that, it was like, you know, frogs' eyes and bats' fur and all the junk that got boiled up in a cauldron when someone wanted to mess around with black magic. I mean, kind of crazy even to mention it, but since it worries you so much, there's no chance you got a witch somewhere in your house, is there? <laughs> The first side panel of the triptych. Hester Higby, from Walt's point of view. A hazy picture, not yet formed, but an icy fear gripping at his vitals. Truth or fancy? That will have to wait Joan's evaluation, at least. And events beyond that. I'll return shortly with that. Of course, nobody believes in witches anymore. And yet, it's a little like superstitions. Nobody believes in them. And yet, do many of us like to have a black cat cross our path? If you're like most people, do you try to avoid walking under a ladder, except for sheer bravado? On the other hand, there are people who are so healthy in mind and body, so open-hearted and so generous, and who, without being Pollyanna, do look by habit on the best side of everything. People like Joan Madden. I should have known not to give in to my old-fashioned sentimentality. Ever since I could walk, I've been a sucker for every stray dog and lost kitten. It wasn't fair to Walt. I knew he didn't want to take on any extra burdens. And it was stupid not to remember that he was just really only getting his nerves back in shape after that freaked-out war he got stuck in. But great-grandpa's letter was so sweet and so sad, I just didn't have the heart to refuse his dying request. So I had to tell Aunt Hester to come and stay with us. I just never figured that Walt would get hurt. Just give me a straight answer, Joan. Have you laid off that seaweed gunk she's been trying to feed you? Of course I have. It's... It's... Yeah. Well, anyway, I, I don't eat anything without researching it first. You know, you talk as though she might try to poison me. I don't know what she's up to. Well, why should she be up to anything? Because she isn't who she's supposed to be. But we don't know that. Joan... Bill Cox got on the telex to the Duluth Police Department and sent me a copy of the teletype he got in reply. Your great-grandfather's wife got incinerated with him when his house burned down. No, she didn't. Joan, let's not kid around. I got this through police channels. Well, so even the police can make a mistake, just like you. What's that supposed to mean? Well, I mean you haven't given Aunt Hester a chance to tell her side of the story. Okay. Let's do that little thing right now. <laughs> Now, let me get this straight, Aunt Hester, or whoever you are. You weren't in the house when it burned down? Then, sakes, Walter, of course not. How could I be here if I had been? Oh, dear. What's the matter? I think I dropped a stitch. Let me see now. Now, look, if you weren't in the house, where were you? I don't think I want to say. Why not? It's sort of important. I suppose it could be made to be. Dear me... He was such a good man and kind, but weak, weak and terribly careless. Oh, oh, it's beginning to get dark, isn't it? I'll turn on some lights. Oh, no, no. First the windows, the drapes and the shutters. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. There. 
There, you see? You like that better? Uh, ever so much. The night must always be shut out, especially here. You can put the lights on now if you want. I'm still waiting for an answer. From me? Oh, yes, about the house burning down. Oh, dear. I hoped I wouldn't have to go into this, but... Now, Walter, don't look so grim. It's all perfectly logical, if if terribly unpleasant. I'm afraid when Charlie wrote that note about me, he wasn't quite telling the truth. He did say he had lupus erythematosus disseminatus, didn't he? Yes. Uh, we didn't know what it was. That's the bad kind, terminal. Only it wasn't true. He was just trying to cover up. Cover up what? Well, that even though I loved him, I'd had to take Smokey and Captain Jack and leave him. Why? Oh, my. I guess I can't pull any punches. You see, Charlie was a chaser. A chaser? He was woman crazy. It had gotten so bad, I, I'd had to move out. Little did I realize how lucky I'd had. Or I would have been burned up in that house. Are you trying to tell me that a man of 82 was still... I... Why? Well, I, I mean, was still messing around with other women? You better believe it, son. And... He had another woman with him when the house burned down? I'm sorry to blacken his name for you, Joni, but that's about the size of it. Oh, the times I used to warn him about smoking those cigars in bed. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You don't actually expect me to believe all this stuff. Why not, when it's the truth? Because it doesn't hold water. I mean, what about this other woman? She must have friends or relatives or something. You can't just leave them wondering what's happened to her. Well, what good would it do them to know that she'd been burned to a crisp? Besides, Darlene was a drifter and a deadbeat. She was also a, a professional. Nobody will miss her. Well, but, Aunt Hester, what about uh, the estate and... and uh... Well, there wasn't any estate. What money we had was mine. Yes, but the house, the insurance... You didn't own it. Charlie had no insurance. Yes, but you've thrown away your identity. You can't even get Social Security or well, anything. I won't be needing any of it. You see, I'm the one who hasn't much longer to live. <gasps> the pains have begun already. I'll be all right, though. The doctor said it would be quick. If if you'll just keep a roof over my head till, till the dark angel comes to fold me in his wings. Poor Walt. His face was a study. I felt almost as sorry for him as I did for poor Aunt Hester. But I managed to get him out of the room and out of the house for a long walk on the beach. Just as well. Because we had what amounted to our first quarrel. And the way he carried on really scared me. And I'm telling you, she's a fake. Well, she's lying through her teeth, and I want her out of this no, house. Darling, please calm down. I... You know, I, I can't just throw my poor old aunt who's sick. Don't you listen to what I'm trying to tell you. She's not your poor old aunt. All right, dear, all right. Don't get yourself so upset. And, and even if she isn't, she's a sweet old lady with nowhere to go. Well, I know where she can go as far as I'm concerned. And as far as I'm concerned, it's right where she belongs, the old witch. Well, that's silly. There's no such thing as a witch. Yes, there is. I'm going to tell you something about that sweet old lady of yours. I think she burned the house down. Why? And by me, the only reason she took a plane here was to make things look good. She could just as easily have made it on a broomstick. Darling, please. Now, look, I, I want you to try and relax. It, it's just like it was after you came back from overseas. Maybe we ought to call Dr. Paul Damon. I don't need Dr. Damon. All I need is the evidence of mine own eyes and ears and my police instincts. What do you mean, evidence of your eyes and ears? I told you. Right down about there, on those rocks, that's where I saw the cat pawing about in the water. And then all of a sudden, the cat changed into Aunt Hester. What? You'd been asleep. That was just a, uh, well, a, a hallucination. I don't hallucinate. Well, not anymore, anyways. And it isn't only that, but she talks to that bird, Captain Jack, all the time. And sometimes there's a third voice, like the cat. And he talks back. I hear them. Don't you? No. So now you think I'm hearing things, too. Oh, darling. Captain Jack says a few little words. But how could a cat talk? Because they're not just a cat and a bird. Any more than she's your Aunt Hester or even human. I tell you, she's a witch. And the other two are her familiars. Her what? 
I went to the library and read up on it. There were two kinds of minor spirits that witches had, or have, called familiars. One was a divining familiar, and the other was a domestic one. Well, honey, look at me. Now, you can't honestly believe all this bilge. Suppose I do. Then I think you're sick, and you ought to see a doctor. Listen, I just want that woman out of the house and out of our lives. Don't ask me to do that to the poor old thing. The, what could she want from me? How, how could she hurt me? I don't know. You can see from the way she treats Kip how harmless and well-meaning she is. Kip! Oh, good Lord. Maybe that's what she's after. The baby, and we left her alone with him. Oh, you'd like to scare me to death. The two of you, running like that and bursting into the house. I thought you'd wake up poor little Kip. Look at him, having a little afternoon nap with Smokey in his arms and Captain Jack perched on the edge of the crib, keeping... <gasps> dear. When the sun goes down, my old bones have an ache. And I look at you, Joan, darling, and think to myself, what a wonderful thing it is to have a young, healthy body at one's command. <laughs> How much you make me long to be just as you are now. But where are you going, Walt? I'm going into town to nail this thing down once and for all. How? I can use the police teletype, and I'm going to get a court order from the Duluth Police Department to exhume the remains of whoever died in that fire. Once and for all, I mean to find out just who and what it is we have living in our house. And, darling, I want to promise from you. What? Don't you leave Kip alone for one minute while I'm gone. Oh, Walt, you're not really serious about this. I was never more serious in my life. Because if that woman represents a threat to you or our future, I wouldn't hesitate for a moment to wipe her off the face of the earth. And that's the reason, just as soon as Walt was gone, I called Dr. Damon. Because the way I saw it, what was wrong around our house was my poor husband. He was back in a tailspin just like after the war. He was round the bend. Somehow I had to find a way to bring him back. The second panel of the triptych. Is Joan right? Has she reason to be worried about Walt? Or is she perhaps worrying about the wrong person, shutting her eyes to the real danger? Is Aunt Hester what she seems to Joan, or what Walt is convinced she is? And if, wild as it seems, she were a witch, what is it she's after? I'll return shortly with Act Three. last for the central panel. The sum and substance of the two side portraits we have examined. The real truth about Hester Madden. But first, a harried phone call from Joan to Dr. Damon, monitored, unaware by either of the principals, by that sweet old lady Hester on a convenient extension. I'm sorry to bother you, doctor, but I am frantic. I don't blame you. I had hoped that Walt had found himself. Uh, can you get him back to town to see me? Oh, I doubt it. Well, uh, I have a free weekend. I might take advantage of this opportunity to run down to the cave. Well, I don't know if we can put you up. Oh, no need. I have a little summer cabin in Orleans. I could uh, just drop in on you uh, casually and check out Walt. Oh, if you only could. Oh, you know me, Paul. I don't flip easily, but well, this whole thing has got me really strung out. Okay. I'll be there. Count on me. Uh, just give me directions, huh? May you roast in hell forever, Dr. Damon, if you try to cross my path. Psychiatrist. Ah! Roast him in hell! Roast him in hell! Quiet! How much time do I still have? Not much. The moon is full this weekend. Yeah. 
Miles has will be in conjunction. Time to make the change to her. Now, can I, Smokey? If she's not prepared. Give me the dry seaweed. I'll make sure that it's dropped in the salad she mixes for dinner. I'd better handle that. No, no good. He wouldn't let you near her, even if she would. Damn and double damn him. May the torch of Hecate singe his eyes. Her spear rip through his vitals, and her hounds run him down and tear him to pieces. If it weren't for him, it all would have been so easy. Maybe it would be better to move as soon as possible, even right now while he isn't here. Yeah. Well, that would be taking too much of a chance for all of us. She's right. Yeah. We exist only as long as you do. Why should I care about you? You're only projections of me that I can snuff out like a candle if I wanted to. I'd be all alone without your familiars to understand and serve you. And if you did send us to eternal nothingness, our voices would still carry to tell them the truth. That you did yeah. not die, as you want them to think. he would come back to reclaim you for its own. No, no. You wouldn't do that to me. As long as you don't do anything to us. <laughs> My true name is Mergeist, and I am the oldest order of witches, the witches of the sea. I was born before the world began, and my span of allotted years was 7,007. But when at last my time came to return and mingle as a nameless droplet among the uncounted of the great oceans, I could not bring myself to obey the law, to escape my avenging sisters of the sea, I had to find an earthly body to house my spirit. I called on all the ancient arts, magic, divination, astrology, enchantment to find a young girl whose sign was my sign, whose birth date reflected the conjunction of our houses, the ascendancy of whose planets and stars matched my own. Every two generations, as the body I have possessed begins to disintegrate with age, I have found countless times a new one to possess. The alternative is too hideous to contemplate. I need the body of Joan Madden, and nothing shall stop me from invading it and making it my own. You mean, guy? Don't call me by that name. Forgive me, yes, darling. How can I afford to wait? Divine me now, Alebka. What is the man Walter Madden doing? He is arranging for an order to exhume the bodies, to examine the one of the woman who died in the fire. You don't want me to see any further? As far as you can. The skull was not destroyed. They will find where you struck her and killed her. And by the teeth, they will know her as someone other than you. They will look further and find the fire was set by someone. And they will start to look for you. I knew it. Agrith, what is the girl doing now? I'm guarding her child because her husband told her to. He is most afraid you mean the boy harm. Does she still trust me? She is not even thinking of you. She worries about her husband, that he is losing control of his mind as he did once before. She does not think that I am a witch. She doesn't believe such things exist. So much the better. Let us do everything to make her think he has gone mad. Who is it? It's Aunt Hester, dear. Oh, uh, just a minute. Is anything wrong? Why, no, dear. That's what I was going to ask you. Oh, shh. Kip's asleep. Oh, Everything all right? <laughs> of course. Why shouldn't it be? Oh, no reason. 
Except it isn't like you to shut yourself away. I thought maybe you or Kip might not be feeling No, well. no, no. It's just this, this cold. I guess I'm just not used to feeling out of sorts. Mm. And if you have a cold, you shouldn't be sitting locked up in the same room with a boy. You'll give it to him. Oh, I never thought of that. I've just made a nice cup of tea. Why don't you come and join me? Following her downstairs, I could feel the saliva thicken in my mouth with envy. I was never more conscious of arthritic joints, the sagging flesh, the muscles that barely had vitality enough to respond to the message of the brain. There in front of me was that shining hair with a natural curl, the lithe muscles rippling just under the skin, the easy, jaunty step that had no fear of the treachery of steps to the old and feeble. Just as we reached the bottom of the stairs, the front door was thrown open hurriedly and Walt came in. Joan, you all right? Of course. Aunt Hester and I were just about to have a cup of tea. Will you join us? Where's Kip? I left him upstairs. He's asleep. Maybe since it won't be too long till dinner, you'd rather have a drink, huh? Uh, no, I... I want to talk to you. Why don't you let me attend to dinner, dear? Why don't you just go in the back, Aunt Hester, and stay in your room? What? Just let me handle things. Of course. I'll go right now. I wouldn't want to be in the way. All right, Smokey, you'll get your dinner. But we're all going to have to wait. Walter just isn't feeling himself tonight. Uh, put him in Section 8. Put him in Section 8. What was he saying? What's Section 8? Service lingo for the nut house, the loony bin. You still think I'm a candidate? Oh, Walt, don't talk like that. Now, just leave me alone. By this weekend, we should know the truth about who that woman is. If she is your sweet old great-grandmother, I'll apologize. But if she's what I think she is, if she means any harm to you or Kip, so help me, I'll murder her. What time is it now? Uh, nine on eight bells, midnight and high tide. Then we must act before them. How to get Joan alone. How to subdue her so I can have the power to take possession. Huh? Wait. Walter is answering, and Joan is in the kitchen alone. This may be our chance. Shh. I want to hear what they're saying. Paul Damon, what are you doing? Well, come in. Come out of that terrible weather. Come in the living room. Joan's in the kitchen. She'll be right out. What brings you here? Did Joan send for you? <laughs> Never mind that now, huh? Hey, come on. Don't try to sidestep. I suppose she thinks I'm blacking out again. If you'd shut up for a moment, no matter what brought me here, the weather is all that matters now. I've been listening to the radio driving up. Blackwater Dunes here is headed for the highest tide in history. There's more danger to you and your family from the elements outside than any foreign element you fear may be loose inside. Shh, watch it. Let me close the door before we talk any further. They're in the living room. And your prey is in the kitchen. It's now or never. Come. Yes, Aunt Hester. What is it? Why are you looking at me like that? In the name of the bornless one that discreate the night and the day. In the name of Iabash. In the name of Ta and Kem. I abjure thee not to move. Oh, my God. Protect me. What was right? Whoa! I blinded her with my wings! My eyes! No, my eyes! I cut her feet away until she fell, mere guys. Now, while she is stunned and helpless, may I The sea is coming for me! What's going on here? Uh, and Hester, what are you doing? Grab her, quickly. Don't let her lips touch Jones. Leave her alone. Don't touch my wife. Oh, good Lord. What is it? She... I... And Hester just came apart in my hands. Look. Which is she? There are five. Six of her. Fetch Kip and run before the sea swamps us all. <laughs> I 
never saw a tide like that. Came in like a giant hand and swept everything away. Oh. You, uh, you all right, Joe? Oh, I, I think so. Oh, thank the Lord you came in time, Paul. Even if it was for the wrong reason? What does that mean? Joan thought you needed psychiatric help. I can't blame her. Anyone who wanders the labyrinths of the mind has to be familiar with ghosts and witches and everything that haunts our dreams, waking and sleeping. There is a phenomenon I know from all my reading that never ceases to haunt me. Even me, who has to deal with the fragmentation of personality so much. Fragmentation? You mean what happened when I tried to grab Hester or, or whatever she was? I'll never forget that sight. A little black, rusty woman who broke up into countless numbers of other little rusty women in black dresses, all mirror images running in every direction at once. Projection of image. The magic secret of only one kind of witch. The sea witch her Celtic heritage and beyond. Perhaps as old as time. That's what Joan was saved from. Becoming another of those faceless bodies she possessed and used up. You mean it was Joan she wanted? Then that, then, that she's still in danger? Not anymore. What do you mean? Look at where your house used to stand. Wiped out by a cataclysmic tide that reached from the sea like a monstrous god hand. You and Joan are safe now. The sea has reclaimed its own. It was the great German poet Goethe who wrote of a mystic goddess who came from the sea. Meergeist, which means simply sea ghost. The sea ebbs and surges, timeless and inexorable. But what it sucks away in the undertow does not always return with the succeeding wave. Eventually, it swallows up what it wills. And no hand, natural or supernatural, can stay it. In the end, the sea always wins. I'll be back shortly. It was Malcolm in Macbeth who said of the end of the Thane of Cawdor, I saw him die. Nothing in his life became him like the leaving it. The context of the remark, of course, was somewhat different. He meant it as a tribute. Hester, or Mergeist's death, was a long-delayed blessing for Joan Madden and all the world. No young girl listening to this story, born under the sign of Virgo, can help but sleep easier tonight and other nights. Our cast included Margaret Hamilton, Christopher Tabori, E.V. Juster, and Gilbert Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. What happened to what I gave you the loan of? Well, it was paid to the old laird the night he died. But he never gave me a receipt, and the money just vanished into thin air. Well, you have the gall to ask me for money when you've thrown away what I gave you already? Here sits Stein Stinson, false friend, thief, braggart, beggar, and bankrupt. The laird and his officers are after him, so help me hold him till they catch him, for I have claim on his horse before any. Stand back, all of you, or any man that approaches me near, I'll run him through. For I'm a desperate man this night, and to save my heart and home and my family, I'll ride the wind with the witches abroad, even if it blows me all the way to hell itself. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
The preceding program was broadcast with the permission of the Columbia Broadcasting System.